Well, we're in the Daniel plan, and we're talking this morning about real change. What does it mean? How do we get to real change? Now, I don't know about you, but um, I find myself from time to time having a drawer in my house or a cupboard in, my, in the pantry somewhere that's just full of gadgets and gizmos and stuff that, you know, you, you've, uh, you've seen somewhere and uh, you bought it and you thought it would save time and it would improve your life and they promised it would and make the best thing out of your life. And you discover you get it home and maybe you take it out of the package and maybe you try it and it doesn't quite do what they said it was going to do. And before you know it, you're not using it anymore and it just kind of sits there in the dust till the next garage sale or the next uh, cleaning day in the community or something like that. And I, 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 maybe you've done that with some subscriptions. Sometimes I've seen some subscriptions online and I've decided, hey, that, that'd be great. I remember one that I just got a few uh, m- months ago, about a year ago actually. And it, it promised me that it would give me kind of the tips and the overlay of, of the economics and what's happening in economics so that so that you could kind of watch the trends and kind of know what's going on and if you got investments or that kind of thing it was going to promise to do that and it had some very very good material but I began to discover that I just got these there's just thousands of emails it seemed like that thousands of emails that I couldn't read them all and keep up with all of it and I finally had to make a priority that I was going to make this a full-time job reading these subscription articles that I got or I had to just kind of ignore them and eventually let that that uh, subscription lapse. I don't know about you, but maybe you found that in your life as well. We want to improve and we get involved. We start out. We have this incredible energy. We're all excited about what's going to happen next. And we put this energy into our lives and we begin to seek to change, but we discover that it's kind of superficial change. It peters out in a couple of days. It peters out in a couple of weeks. We make some promises. We make some New Year's resolutions. We turn over a new leaf. We do something and then all of a sudden it just kind of we lose the enthusiasm. Something happens to us in our lives. How do you get back that enthusiasm? How do you maintain real change in your life? Well, I want to take you back to the owner's manual because here is the owner's manual for everything in your life that you you need and that I need if we're going to be successful in living the kind of life that God has called us to live. And in Romans 12, there is a number of verses I want you to look at with me this morning that give us some principles, some instructions about how we can make change permanent in our lives so that we can have lasting change in our lives. Some of you are making goals physically, emotionally, that's taking place in your lives. Next week, we're going to talk about how to set those goals, what the Bible says about setting goals for ourselves so that we can reach those goals and it becomes an encouraging thing to us. So how do we begin to make lasting change in our lives? And I want you to look at these principles of lasting change with me this morning. The first principle we're going to look at is what I call the principle of consecration. Look at chapter 12 of Romans, the verse one. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Now, what that simply means is, is that I come to a place in my life where I consecrate, I dedicate, I commit my whole being including my body, I commit it to the Lord Jesus Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to work in our life. Now, if you have never invited Jesus to be the master, savior, leader, and Lord of your life, then you're not in a condition to be able to fully commit yourself to the Lord. Because Paul is not talking to unbelievers here. He's talking to believers. These were people who had come to Christ, who were in the church, who were seeking to live for Jesus Christ. He's not talking to unbelievers. So if you're an unbeliever, you've never committed your life to Christ. You've never said, Jesus, come in, forgive my sins. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Save me from my sins. Become my master, savior, leader, and Lord. That's the first step you need to take to be eligible for what we're going to talk about here this morning. And what Paul is saying here. So here's how this happens. I commit Christ. He comes in to live. The Holy Spirit comes to live in my life. But it isn't long that every believer, this is what the Bible teaches here. Every believer eventually comes up against resistance to the will of God in their lives. 
And I discover that I'm in a civil war. I discover that I want to do God's will over here, but I want to do my will. I want to do what I want to do. I want to do God's will, but I want to do it my way. Because I think I know better than God what I need. And so I don't want to trust him. And besides, I've been hurt before in my life. And I'm afraid if I give myself to him, that he'll hurt me just like everybody else has hurt me in my life. So I don't trust him with all of my life. And so there comes this resistance. And God says to us, somewhere in this life, he says to us, I'd like for you to do this. And I'm like, whoa, I don't want to do that. That doesn't feel good. I don't like that. And there comes this war that begins to, to, to grow and escalate in our lives. The Bible teaches that the reason that is, is because even though you're a believer, there is a sin nature that still remains in you that you were born with. And just because you've come to Christ, the sin nature is not taken care of at the moment of your conversion. That needs another work of God's grace that takes care of the sin nature that says, I want to have my own will. I want to do it my way. I want to define my life. I want to be in control of my life. And sometimes when we get saved, we're not aware of that battle that is going on. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 7. He talks about the battle that goes on. The things that I want to do, I end up not doing. The things I shouldn't do, I end up doing. Why do I keep doing this stuff? I know it's wrong, but I don't have any power to do that. It's because you have the sin nature, and it keeps dragging you down. It keeps taking you back to the old patterns. It takes you back to sin. It takes you back to the old ways of living. And before you know it, you'll foul out and won't even be living in Christ anymore. You can lose your, what God has done in your life because you failed to move on to obedience to surrender your life. So the Apostle Paul is talking here about who's going to be in charge of your life. And that's the result of presenting. That's why he says to believers here, present your bodies, your whole being. Now as your believers, bring your whole being as a living sacrifice on the altar of God. That means you give up yourself you die to yourself. You die to what you want. You start wanting only what God wants. You're always finding out what God wants to do in your life. Now, when you begin to do that, the Bible says that the Spirit of God will come and cleanse you as you present your body. As you consecrate your body, He cleanses that from the sin nature so that the sin nature no longer has effect or power in your life. You stop living the way of life and the attitude that says, I want to do God's will, but I want to do my will. And you die to that and you come to a place in your life as Jesus did when he was going to the cross. He didn't like everything that was coming down in his life. And he said, Lord, is there a possibility I can get out of this? If there's a way that I can get his cross, do I have to do this? I don't want to do the cross. But you remember what his final decision was. Because he understood what it was to live in the spirit and he was without sin. God wants to do that in our lives. He wants to take out the sin nature. And Jesus could say, okay, if there's no other way that this can happen, but uh, that I go to the cross, not my will, that's where we have to come, not my will, not what I want, but your will be done in my life. Now, when I do that, then I, I present my body to him. And when I present my body, it changes the way I live because as I present my body to him, that means I present my muscles to him. And, and muscles connect with our emotions and our attitudes and our spirit. You can't separate the body. So as you present your body to him, it influences your moods. It influences your language, your posture, physiology, affects your psychology. In fact, let's do an experiment right here, right now. I want everybody just to, just to, if you're not already doing this, just sit up real straight in your chair and take a huge, big breath. Everybody do that? Doesn't that feel good? Now, did you realize, you say, that didn't change much in my life. Well, I'll tell you what it did change. What, from my perspective, you look a whole lot better right now than you did about two seconds ago. Why? Because your posture has changed. You've taken in some oxygen. There's something that's happened. There's even some color in some of your cheeks that I can see in the shadows of the lights. There's something that happens, and you, you are now sitting up ready to say, I'm ready to listen to what God has to say to me. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to be what he wants me to be. I want to do God's will in my life. Now, how do I make this consecration? 
Well, it starts off here by, therefore, I urge you brothers. Now, we, we know that when there's a therefore in the Bible, we need to see why it's therefore, and there's something that's come before. And indeed, there's been 11 chapters that I don't have time to go through this morning, but the Apostle Paul has been talking about a lot of stuff in 11 chapters. He's been talking about in the, in the first three chapters about the fact that the gospel is able to change us and make a difference in our life and has a power to save us from sin. And then he talks about that all of sin and comes short of the glory of God. We all need a Savior. And then he gets into chapter 5 and he talks about being justified, declared not guilty. Because Jesus died on the cross, we have been justified by faith and life has changed. Then we get over into chapter 6 and we begin to hear the call to go on to holiness and sanctification. What does that mean? That means I'm going to take my life that Jesus has changed. I've been buried with him in baptism. I've been raised to new life in Christ. But that's not the stopping point. I'm supposed to move on so that I begin begin to offer my body, the instruments of my physical body, I offer them to God for doing righteous, right things rather than sinful things. And then he moves into chapter 7 and says, we got a problem. I mean, not only have you committed acts of sin, but you've got this sin nature. Now, I want to take care of that. And in chapter 8, he then gives us the promise that you can live in the power of the Spirit where there's no condemnation, and you can be set free from the sin nature till you desire one thing, and that is the will of God at any cost, at any price. You're going to follow Jesus no matter what others do, no matter what happens in your life. You're going to follow Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 9 11, he talks about the Jews and the Gentiles coming together and then he comes to this chapter 12 he says in light of God's justifying grace in fact that the power to save us from sin the fact that he's changed our lives and made a provision through the cross okay folks now here's what you're going to do therefore I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice in your life now, would you, would, would, you, would you agree with me that if I offer my body as a living sacrifice, that's voluntary? Yeah. Nobody's going to force you to change. Nobody's going to force you to follow Jesus. Nobody's going to force you to become sanctified holy and allow Jesus to be number one and first place in your life. Nobody can force you to change. And you can't change anybody else. Maybe you've already discovered that you can't change your husband. Maybe you discovered you can't change your wife. Maybe you discovered you can't change your kids. You can't change your buddies, your friends. You can't change. There's only one person that you can change and only that by the grace of God. And that's yourself. You can only change yourself in your life. So that brings us to the first law this morning. That if I'm going to change, the first law of change is, it is my choice to change. It's not anybody else's. I can't blame anything else in my life. I have to change, offer myself to God. Now, here's what the problem is. It says, the next verse says, how do you do that? Well, it's the Old Testament language of the altar. So they had an altar. It was not like this, but it was a lot bigger and square. And they would sacrifice dead animals on it to God. But Jesus came and became the sacrifice. So we don't have to sacrifice animals anymore. So now Paul says, we don't offer dead sacrifice anymore. But we are asking you to offer your body as a living sacrifice sacrifice on the altar of God that's what we do that's the imagery now here's what the problem is for a lot of Christians we offer ourselves at one time but then some stuff comes into our life that we don't like so you know what you do you sneak yourself off and the living sacrifice because it's living can crawl off the altar and walk away and there's some believers this morning right here in this crowd that one time you, you made a living sacrifice to God and you said, Lord, not my will, but yours, whatever you want in my life. But somewhere something happened in your life and you crawled off the altar. And so now it's, you're in the battle again, my will versus God's will. And so Paul says, if you're going to have lasting change, you've got to keep the living sacrifice on the altar. You've got to offer yourself to God in those moments. Why? Well, because it's a spiritual act of worship. What do you mean? It's a spiritual act of worship. Did you know that taking care of your body and presenting it to God is a spiritual act? You're worshiping. Well, how do I do that? You do that when you put the right food in your body. You do that when you detox. 
You do that when you cleanse your body. You do that when you control your body. And, and instead of using it for sin and unrighteousness and stuff in your body, you, you use it for, for God and for the kingdom of God in your life. And you have to start with the physical. It says offer your whole body, mental, physical, financial, spiritual, social, whatever. If you're going to have change in your life, you have to offer it all. Now, some of us will say, well, I'm just too tired to change. You don't, you don't have enough energy to change. You, 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 you try to do this in your own life, but you don't have enough energy. Well, that brings us down to the fact that, that when, when you're living in such a way that you come home, you'd rather turn on dancing with the stars instead of dancing under the stars. You, you don't know. You don't have any energy left. You just veg out because you don't have any energy. Well, what do we do with that? Well, that brings us to the second principle that Paul teaches us here. It's the principle that becomes, actually, it's the theme of, of the life skills program and life skills classes that we teach here at Greater Life. This is it right here. We, we, we are no longer to be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world. We're not, we're not to think like the world anymore, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's the principle of concentration. That's what we're dealing with. The principle of concentration. That's why it starts with the mind. Because what is in your mind is what gets your attention. And the word he uses here, being transformed, that's the, the word literally from which we get the word metamorphosis. Well, what's metamorphosis? Well, that's what a caterpillar does when it becomes a butterfly. So that caterpillar is crawling along the ground one day. And all of a sudden, it wraps itself up in a cocoon and disappears. But when it comes back, it doesn't come back as an improved caterpillar. <laughs> it doesn't come back as a reformed caterpillar. It doesn't grow any more legs as if a caterpillar needed more legs. No, when it comes back, it doesn't even look like a caterpillar anymore. It's a beautiful butterfly that has abilities that it never had before. It's not just crawling with a thousand legs now. It has wings that can take it clear to South America in a migration. And the butterfly changes, it metamorphoses, and God wants to not only give us just a new life, but he wants to transform you, and he wants to do it now. He wants to transform you into a different kind of person. You don't just turn over a new leaf. You don't just say, well, I'm going to do better next year. I'm going to do better next week. He wants to transform you from the inside out. That's what Paul is talking about here. And we begin to look at this, 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 this word for transform is in the imperative. Now, what that means is, is it means it's something you're supposed to do right now. This isn't something you're going to do next week. This isn't something you're going to do when I get to a certain point in my Christian life. No, Paul says, today, do it right now. Be transformed starting this second. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice and start being transformed right now. Well, what happens? Well, that's what holiness and change is all about. You become teachable. Start right now. You're not going to be everything God wants you to be this moment, but you're going to begin to have a heart change this moment that begins to allow God to work in your life. You become teachable. You quit being resistant. You quit being smart aleck. You stop being proud. You begin to let Jesus work in your life, and you begin to rewire by the renewing of your mind. Translate, rewiring of your brain to God's truth. Not mama's truth, not daddy's truth, not Pastor Lee Ray's truth, not greater life's truth, not to some Nazarene doctrine truth, but to God's truth. You begin to transform, and the renewing and the rewiring of your brain to God's truth in every area of your life. Well, how do you do that? Well, by the renewing of your mind. You know what that means? That means you have to stop thinking the way you're thinking. It means you have to begin to stop thinking. Of, you have to start bringing every thought, literally. This is hard work now. This isn't no magic trick. Start taking every thought in your brain and asking, how does this compare with what God wants in my life? You stop the stinking thinking in your life. 
You set up a checkpoint in your mind. When we go to Europe to visit our son, there's this interesting thing that happens when you get ready to cross over into other countries. Almost every country you go to cross in, there's this, this checkpoint where there's some booths and, and it's not just a toll road. I mean, they, they're going to search your car if they want to. They can get you out of your car. They can search the whole thing for contraband and illegal stuff and, and they can search you and take a, take a look at you. They, I mean, they can check you over and not allow you into the country until you satisfy the search process in their life. That's, that's, that's the image here. God says you're going to take every thought and bring it up to a checkpoint gate. And you're going to examine it to see, does it belong in God's country or not? If it doesn't belong in God's country, we're leaving it at the border. And we're going to let God work in our lives. So I have to start thinking differently. You, you've got to stop focusing on what's bad for you and start focusing on what's good for you in your life. You, you stop focusing on the negative and you start focusing on the positive. That's what it means to not conform. Have you ever done anything stupid or dumb or risky because everybody else was doing it? <laughs> and how'd that work out for you? Some of you regretted that. You take this risk in your life. You do something because it was cool, because everybody else was doing it. And it was popular. It was a cool thing. You know, I've talked to hundreds of people about like things like their smoking habit, the, the cigarette. Do you know when I talk to people, most people who started smoking cigarettes didn't do it because they, they, they said, hey, this tastes good. This is really, really fun. In fact, most of them are <coughs> the first time around. And the reality is that most people will tell you they started smoking because somebody else introduced them to it and said, hey, this is cool. And then all of a sudden we're hooked. And some of us get hooked for a lifetime. That's the reality. That's what we call an addiction. So the Bible says here, we, when we get addicted, it says here, no longer being conformed to this world. Circle the words no longer or any longer. They're in your notes. You see, when you do something for a long time, it's called a bad habit. It starts off. You copy somebody else. You work in that. And you now come to this addiction. It's your habit. So the Bible says you've got to stop doing what you've been doing that's been the habit of your life and bring every thought into captive obedience to Christ and every addiction in your life and look at that. Now, that's not real easy because 98% of everything that you struggle with in the addictions and the life patterns of your life were ingrained in you, most of us, before the age of 10. We learned life patterns. We learned it from mom and dad. We learned it from teachers. We learned it from various places. We got hurt and we learned how to develop kind of a personality that protects us from being hurt again. And so we've kind of developed that personality. We've, we've learned how to survive in our world. And we, we watch these patterns. I watch every spring as we've had this a pair of geese that come out here, lay a nest in here and, and terrorize everybody for about two weeks. Some of you have been flogged. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. But when those, little, when those little goslings hatch, it's the cutest little thing. I got to be here when they hatched. And it was the neatest thing. Here's Mama and Papa Goose. And they're going across the parking lot. And then they stopped at the curb. And they started modeling to the baby goslings how to get up over a curb. Now, that's not an easy thing for a gosling. And, and so they would model it. And then they'd turn around, look. And the goslings would try. And they'd fall and bop their beak on the concrete and they try this several times and finally they'd learn how to kind of hop up there and then the one behind them he'd kind of try it he'd fall back and then they'd try it and they kept working because they modeled that even the geese understand that we model and so we learn things we model things in our lives and we pick up these models and, and we've learned some models some of you've learned some models of handling anger that are not healthy in your life you learned them somewhere some of you learned patterns of eating that are not healthy for your body. Some of you have learned patterns of relationships that are not healthy in your life. They weren't very good in your life. And you learned these models and these patterns and they were defective. They've actually ended up hurting you in your life. So you're not, so, so what the Bible's saying here is you're going to have to learn new patterns. 
No longer conforming to the old patterns. Not, not conforming to the old ways and the old models. You're going to have to learn some new models. And that's the second law. If we're going to have lasting change right out of God's word here. I have to change my model. I have to change my model. I'm going to have to look at something new. And ultimately, ultimately, the model that I need to look at is Jesus. Because he's the perfect model. He's the absolute perfect model of what it means to be a human being. 20 times Jesus says, follow me. Why? Because he needs, we're the, he's the model for us. A bunch of times, Paul, up to six times, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. So we become the model for each other if we're in Christ. Follow me as I'm following Christ. Now that brings us to the third principle. And that's the principle of evaluation. Look at verse 3. It says, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. That's humility. But rather think of yourself. In other words, evaluate yourself with sober judgment. In other words, get real about where you're at and what's going on in your life. In accordance with the measure of faith... God has given to you. Now, if I were to call you up today and I didn't know where you live and, I, and, you, and you said, I want you to come over to my house and, and, and I would, or you called me up and said, I'm coming to your house and you say, how do I get to your house? Let's put it that way. How do I get to your house? Well, what would, what would be the first thing that I'd say to you? Where are you at? Right? Where are you at? No, probably what I first say to you, you don't have GPS? What's the matter with you? It's the 21st century. No, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> Where are you? And you'd say, well, I'm, uh, I'm at Homemakers on Douglas. Oh, okay, that helps me. So I can tell you how to get to my house from Homemakers on Douglas. When people ask where the church is, I say, well, which way direction are you coming from? Well, I'm coming from the west. Well, okay, if you're coming from the west and you know where I-35 is, you get off at Douglas. And I, I, I lead them in here and we're just south of Homemakers. And I, oh, yeah, 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 we can give those landmarks. And, and they figure that out. But we have to know where they're at. So what the, what the scripture is teaching us here is that I have to begin to know where I'm at. That's going to be the third principle of change. You need to know where you're at if you're going to be able to allow God to work in your life to change you. And you've got to do it humbly. That's the greatest barrier to change. See, most of us, we want to go around and say, well, I don't got any problems. You know, my kids are the perfect, most perfect kids in the world. My kids don't have any problems. They're just fine. My kids don't have any problems. No, I'm, I'm sure my kid wouldn't have done that in school. He's perfect. And see, we begin to live in this world of, of, of pink elephants in the room, but nobody acts, act, we, everybody acts like it's not there. But we walk around it all the time. I have to humbly come. So the Bible says, don't think of yourself more highly. In other words, be, be humble. Remember that the man who gets too big for his britches will inevitably be exposed in the end. <laughs> yeah? That's right, isn't it? I don't have any problems. Yes, we all got problems. We need God's help. Think of your life with sober judgment. Be honest in the estimate of yourself, as the New Living Translation says. And so what I would ask you this morning is, what is it in your life that you're not willing to face as a problem? What are you pretending isn't a problem in your family? That really is. What are you pretending in your marriage isn't a problem that really is? What are you pretending in your workplace that's a problem, but everybody keeps ignoring, ignoring it? What are you pretending in your health is not a problem when in reality it is? And what are you going to have to do to change in these next few months? Do you have the courage to be honest with yourself? Do you have the courage, if you can't be honest with yourself, do you have the courage to go to someone else who you can trust, the friend, and say, what do you see in my life? That needs to change. Now, I'll take some guts. What do you see that needs to be improved in my life? Then notice what the rest of the verse says. In accordance with the measure of faith God has given to you. Circle the phrase measure of faith. That's the word in the Greek that we get the metric system from. So it's literally the measuring of ounces and millimeters and cups and ounces and, and, and grams and all that. That's the, 
That's the language that you measure. Well, how do you measure? What do you mean? How do I begin to do that in my life? How do I become real and measure and evaluate where I'm at? How do I act this out? Well, you need to set some goals. And and you need to, to record the progress. And what you can begin to do in your life is look at and evaluate the base numbers. Now, let me talk to you about physically. Part of the Daniel plan, and we've already done this, and maybe you've done it in your group, and if you haven't, go, you can go to danielplan.com, 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 and in there, it will take an a inventory of your basic health numbers, your weight, your height, your blood pressure, and I hope in a, in a week or so we can do some of those things as a part of this. And you put those numbers in, and, and it's developed by medical doctors on the Daniel plan. You can get a picture of where you're at in your physical body mass and where you are in healthy. I did that the other day. I was kind of surprised. I was kind of surprised. I discovered, uh, according to the numbers, I could stand to lose a little <laughs> to be most healthy. So I got, you know, I, I'm going to have to get in this myself. I've had to start changing some habits this week because my body mass says you're overweight. And I've been going, no, I'm not. I'm at the, I'm at the border. <laughs> so I had to get some honesty. What am I going to do about that? I had to look at that. What are the key areas of faith? I'm going to measure that and begin to measure. I can never change if I don't measure it. And discover where I'm at. I will never change. Why is measurement so important? Because the third law of change from the word of God is. I can only manage what I measure. So I must know my measurements. I must know where I'm at. I must know my location. If I'm going to make a change in my life. And I need to track it. I'm going to have to keep track of it. I'm going to have to go back to that. Now, the fourth principle is this, community. I want you to look at this community. Look at the verse 4. Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has special function, so it is with Christ's body. We're all parts of one body, and each of us has a different work to do. And since we're all one body in Christ, we belong to each other, and each of us needs all the others. I didn't say that. God said it. Circle, circle the word we belong to each other and we need each other. You need me. I need you. And that's the law of community. And what that means is, is that if I'm going to live out this verse, then you and I must get in and get group support. You won't make lasting change in your life, God says, until you're willing to get some group report, uh, uh, group support and begin to realize that we belong to each other and we all belong to each other and we can't do this solo in our life. You, you will change faster, better, and longer and more completely and permanently only if you're in community in doing it. That's what God's Word says. But see, I, I want to be exempt from that. I want to be the Lone Ranger. I want to be solo in this deal. I don't want to open up to anybody. I don't want to tell anybody what's going on. I don't want to tell anybody how much I weigh. I don't want to have, hold myself accountable where I'm supposed to be and where I'm going in this process. I want to play this thing by myself. And the fact is, so I go to the Barnes & Noble and I get a self-help book and I'm going to figure this out by myself. Well, they have a lot of good ideas. Most of the ideas, if you even try them, you'll do them for about three days, maybe three weeks, and then you won't do it anymore. Why? Because there's nothing to hold you account. We need each other. All the self-help books in the world only can give you the principles, but it's in the community and the group that God... Why is that the way? Because that's the way God exists as Trinity. He's in a small group. God doesn't even exist without a small group. But we keep thinking we can I'm going to do this solo. It's just me and Jesus. No, 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 no. That's, that's not the Christian that the Bible talks about. The Christian the Bible talks about who has given themselves on the living sacrifice on God's altar and is being renewed in their mind and transformed is plugged into a group somewhere and saying, help me. I need your prayers. I need you to talk to me about my spiritual life and I need to help you. That brings us to the, 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 the fifth principle, the principle of affirmation. Look at verse 9. 
Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is evil. Now, sometimes that means intervention. That means sometimes that love has to confront. That means sometimes love creates conflict. I had to enter some conflict this week. I don't know how it's going to hurt. I hope they like me when it's all done, but I can't guarantee that. But I, I, love says I had to do that, even if they end up hating me. I, I have to love as Jesus loved. Oh, well, you, well, you say, I don't like to do that. Well, you don't have rights to yourself anymore. You remember, we just laid it on the altar. And Jesus had to confront people, and they crucified him for it. So if I'm going to be a follower of Jesus, then, then I have to face the fact that sometimes love means I have to confront somebody about something that's going on in their life or in the relationship, and I have to confront somebody about that, and sometimes it don't feel good at all, and sometimes it doesn't turn out too good. But the fact is, if I'm following Jesus, then I have to do it, and I have to live with the consequences. And then it says, you've got to love enough times to confront, love each other with genuine affection, and take delight in honoring each other. See, the other side of conflict and confrontation and, and evaluation is this other side where we need to be honoring each other, encouraging each other. Well, what does that mean? That means that when your group, when people in your group, they win financially or health or, or, or sickness or illness, they get some victories over that, some wonderful things happen in your life, you start celebrating that. They lose two pounds, that's so for some people, that's huge. Celebrate it. That's a wonderful thing. Have a party. Just don't bring the cake. You got a little bit of debt? Fantastic. You've been able to overcome and get out and pay off a credit card? I just got to send a note this last week with somebody who's been accountable to me, and I knew what the deal was, and they paid off a, they paid off a debt. And I sent them a note and said, yay, one more. Well, that... That's only a drop in the bucket of the 60000 I owe. <laughs> Forget about the 60000 well, At least we paid this one off. We're making progress. And we send the note. You've had a breakthrough in your marriage? Let's celebrate it. The Bible says that we're to outdo each other and take delight in honoring each other. That's the fifth law of change. I must live in and give love if I'm going to have lasting change in my life. Why? Because love refreshes, love invigorates, love heals, love encourages, love builds up. In fact, the Bible says that love is stronger than death. Think about that. If it's stronger than death, then love is stronger than debt. It's stronger than divorce. It's stronger than, than, than sickness. It's stronger than anything that you're up against today. It is, it is stronger than any of them if you'll let God work His love into your life. It's the strongest power in the universe. And when you do that, here's what happens. You begin to not only be ministered to, but you learn to give that love away. And the fact is, when I learn to give love away, something begins to come back toward me. Because as I give, Jesus said, give and it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, measured, <laughs> running over. Give as you have been given. That's why I need to be a part of a small group. It's not just so that people can help me, but I need to be in a small group to help other people. We say, I don't like those people in a group. Well, I know. Some of you have got ERGs, extra grace or EGRs, extra grace required. And you say, I don't have any of those in my group. Well, it's probably you. <laughs> when I don't have any EGRs in my group, I start looking at me. <laughs> I must be it. Because every group has an EGR, extra grace required. You know what that means? That means we have to learn to love. What are we going to learn to love in the laboratory of a small group with people that aren't always fun to be around? But that's why the church is different than the Rotary Club and it's different than your club at school and it's different than your other clubs where you can come in and out because you like them or don't like them. I don't like them. I don't want to be a part of that. I quit. No, you can't quit the church and follow Jesus. Uh-oh, uh-oh, did you hear me? Did I just say that? You can't quit the church and be a disciple of Jesus Christ. It won't measure up with the book, the owner's manual. Because Jesus died for the body, the community. And if he died for it, then he can help you to live with it and in it. 
And I want to know, do you love Christ enough and you love his body enough that you're willing to live in the church with all the warts and all the challenges that come with flawed humanity? We need a group. That brings us to the last principle, the principle of motivation. You want lasting change? Look at verse 11 and 12. Never be lacking in your zeal. Now, some translations put that as enthusiasm. Never, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. Not fever, but fervor. That means you nurture your enthusiasm. Then he tells you how to do it. In serving the Lord, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in your prayers. Wow. That's the sanctified life. That's the life in the spirit. That's the life of the living sacrifice that stays on the altar. I nurture my zeal, my enthusiasm. I've got to figure out how to maintain. How do you do that? Let me ask you this question, because sometimes I need help with this. How do you maintain your enthusiasm over the long haul? How do you do it for 30 years? Not for three years, not for a couple of years. How do you do it for 30 years? years how do you do it up against delays how do you maintain your enthusiasm up against detours how do you maintain your enthusiasm when everything you plan comes crashing down and your dreams are laying in ashes at your feet and you've worked really really hard to make those happen how do you nurture this kind of thing well only in the spirit of God and here's how he tells us to do that how, how do you do that you see if you don't have this ability to nurture then, then, then you're going to run into trouble because you'll say, I want to get out of debt a little bit. But you won't make any real changes. You, you'll say, I really want to get in shape, but pass me the potato chips. That's what will happen in your life. You can't go into this thing half wholehearted, half whole hum. And if you notice that people with enthusiasm often start with enthusiasm, but somewhere it peters out. Why is that? Because they haven't learned this principle. And here's part of this principle. Too many of us set too high a goals, too high a goals, and then we try to accomplish them too soon. We try to accomplish our goals. They're too high or too low, and then we try to accomplish them too soon in our lives. So how do I do this? How do I stay enthusiastic? Well, you say, well, it's positive thinking. No, no, no. Positive thinking is a good thing. I'm all for it. But no, positive thinking will only take you so far. You do it through faith. How does faith work? The Bible says here that we do this. How do we do it? Because there's a lot of stuff in our world that isn't, isn't very positive. Rape isn't positive. Terrorism isn't positive. Death and cancer isn't positive. That won't get you through the tough times. How do you stay enthusiastic? Well, the word here gives us the clue. Enthusiasm is actually two words that mean in theos. You know what theos is in a Greek? It's the word for God. So the word enthusiasm literally means in God. In God. And that's that's the sixth law if you're going to have lasting change in your life. You're going to have to live your life and get in God and keep getting in God and keep getting in God and keep coming back to God and keep coming back to God because enthusiasm doesn't exist unless you're in God. <laughs> That's how this works out. And then we live in this enthusiasm in our life. That's how you keep your spiritual fervor. That's how you become joyful in hope, even when things are going wrong. That's how you win in the end. God's plan is that you win. You win in the end, but only if you endure. And endurance doesn't mean grit your teeth and hold on. It means being in God. It means living with a constant consecration of my life on the altar and letting that continue to happen. It means concentration where I'm being transferred right now. I start right now. 
by the rethinking brain, brain, rewiring of my brain, and I bring everything to the checkpoint, and I begin to evaluate, okay, where am I at, and where does God want to take me, and how do I cooperate with him to get there? And I learn to do that in community. I cooperate with his plan, community, small group. I get in a small group, say, Lord, help me, help my small group to help me, so that I can be a blessing to the small group. And then we begin to move in the direction of helping us to move forward and become all that God wants us to be. And it changes us forever. You need to get into God. So where do you need to start this morning? Which one of those principles? Is it evaluation? You need to get honest about where you're at. What is it you're pretending isn't happening in your life that is? What is it you're trying to hide from everybody else because you don't want to have to deal with it? You're going you're gonna to live in the spirit. Spirit won't let you get away with that. He's going to say, hey, 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 no secrets here. Let's get it out here where we can transform it and renew it. Not next week, right now. Maybe it is this morning. You've, you're a believer. Your sins have been forgiven. You've been trying to live for Jesus the best you know how, but you have been resisting this increasing pressure in your life that you know, I need to, I need to put myself on the altar of God, a living sacrifice. I need to get into that mode of living. I need God to change the self-centeredness where everything is about me and every question is, how's it going to affect me? Instead of, how's this going to affect God and God's work in my life? Maybe someone here this morning, you need to surrender the whole idea of trying to do this by yourself. You don't like to be in groups because, you know what? You got hurt in groups. Somebody hurt you. You don't want to be in a small group. You don't want to have to be accountable. You don't want to have somebody lay hands on you and pray for you once in a while. You don't want to have to do that because, you know, that is, you know that's weird. We have to die to that if you're going to live with lasting change. The Spirit won't let you do that. You know why? Because He's existed in eternity in a small group. He's not going to let you get by with that. Where do you need to plug in? What is it that he needs to do? What is the God trying to change in concentration? What needs to be rewired in your brain? What patterns of your family life in the past need to be changed? You don't have to trash everything. But you need to throw out the junk that doesn't work. That's not of God. And you won't do it by yourself. You're going to need help. What is it the Holy Spirit would say to you? You say, well, I've been trying for a lot of years. Yep. Which one of these principles has been left out? What did you drop off? Because I believe these principles, if you'll live them, God will help you. He'll heal your body. 75% of every I just read an article just the other day. 75% of all of the chronic diseases in our country that we treat at the cost of $2.5 trillion a year at the root began as a curable disease or as an emotional problem that we wouldn't deal with. I didn't say that. That's the statistics. 2.5. You know what? We wouldn't need Obamacare. We wouldn't have to worry about that. We just take care of ourselves. If we just trust God and let God work in our bodies and do what we're supposed to do and get the right stuff going in and live by these principles, we, we wouldn't have to be fighting about Obamacare all the time. We wouldn't need it. If we just live as the church, 